Thanks. So, having a double culture background from both Sweden and South Korea has intrigued me to really be fascinated by trying to understand totally different cultures. So exactly eight years ago, I decided to radically change my career from being an innovative, pioneering entrepreneur developing mobile apps. And yes, this was year 2000, so I was quite early. And timing is important, but still I could see the future. And actually entering the secret wall garden of the inner world of public sector healthcare. And I was shocked. I mean, it was just like Alice in Wonderland. Things were just upside down. And here are three things that I actually would like to share that I saw as a healthcare rookie. The first theme I call operations on organs versus operations on organizations. So we have medically trained, educated doctors who are really skillful in operating organs. That's very good. Me, myself, I have been trained at management school, business school, and I would say it's experience in operating organizations. But what I saw is that on all management levels, including the top management, the doctors were also operating the organizations. And I thought, hmm, well, it's like me actually operating you on an open heart surgery. And I think, really, that's not a good idea. The second theme I call evidence-based medicine versus opinion-based management. We all know that in healthcare we use evidence-based medicine, and this is good, because we don't want to have accidents and tragedies like the one in Finland, where a shaman was treating a little baby that had diabetes, and the baby died. But when it comes to operating organizations, once again, we have lots of evidence-based management, but opinion-based management is used. So I also thought this was kind of interesting. And the third theme I call confrontation versus collaboration. I don't want to say this, but actually there is a war going on in healthcare between hospital managers and medical doctors. It's actually quite often that you see battle between doctors from different medical specialties. And we all talk today how important it is to have collaboration of multidisciplinary teams. And I really can say that you can see this frictional energy that is polluting the system. And this is quite different from my experience as an entrepreneur, where I mean collaboration between system architects, application developers, marketing managers. Of course, this was such a key to come up with creative solutions and also producing creative energy. And I later found out actually that innovative companies in the private industry, like Apple and Google, are classified as happy organizations, whereas public sector healthcare is called the press organizations. And I also read studies about an extremely high proportion of doctors and nurses getting burnt out. And I'm really worried, because if our last resort is getting sick, who is going to take care of us? And they are definitely needed, because more and more people are getting sicker. Take cancer, for example. We have every year, actually, 50,000 new cancer victims only in Sweden. And this is equivalent to six every hour, which means that after this TED session, 25 people in Sweden will have had a cancer diagnosis. And by the end of today, that would be 150. And then only in 2D case, there will be a doubling of cancer. And we know that people are getting older, like men of our parents born in the 1940s, is totally exploding into bulk of people that are also getting so much sicker, because we can see a concentration of these very complex diseases in the late ages. And this, of course, means that they will consume lots of resources 
in healthcare. So how about young people? Well, the young working force that is supposed to kind of well, lift this burden is shrinking, we know that, but younger people are also getting sicker, especially lifestyle-related diseases like diabetes. So we have a huge gap between the needs of healthcare and what resources we have. Just take world's largest economy, the US, as an example. A fifth of their GDP is going to healthcare. Just think about it. Every fifth dollar. And cynics actually call healthcare US largest industry. But seriously speaking, healthcare expenses is now accelerating at a much higher speed than GDP. And this means that the healthcare expenses is literally eating up our economy. And this pattern goes for all industrialized countries. And is this something new? Didn't we know this? Of course not. Politicians have known this for years and decades. And we have had so many reforms, but no change. And this question intrigued me. So the latest years I have been researching into why reforms have not led to any change. And of course, there are multiple explanations, but I will kind of highlight three. The first one, blame it on politicians, ill-designed reforms. Um, it's everything from the uh, reimbursement system to focus too much on process and so forth. The second one that I actually discovered is also the fact that, well, you kind of can blame, on, blame some of it on doctors. Because doctors is historically seen, and still today, a very, very strong peer group that have been very effectively fending off reforms. And I can really see every day that there are so many doctors that have developed severe allergies towards management consultants in particular, imposing lean, BPR, TQM, and all that stuff. But I also wonder if this might be the price we have to pay for democracy. Because research shows that it takes at least a decade for a reform to settle and pay off. But we know we have election every fourth year. And we know that when we have a new political majority, we will have a new reform, cheering up a newly introduced reform. So we have system participants that are so tired of reforms. And I can see daily that nurses and doctors their mistrust of politicians and managers is unfortunately quite high. So we have a toxic symptom, we have a tox toxic system, and uh, the first I want to raise is the uncontrollable cost. Um, in a way, healthcare industry is unique because it has something called cost paradox, which means that the more you try to save costs, the more you generate costs. In fact, uh, some call it the black hole because it's kind of just consuming so much resources that no one knows exactly where it comes from. So we have a trend of accelerating rising costs and it's our tax money, at least in Sweden. The second toxic symptom I am more worried about as a patient is about the quality. I just wonder if you knew that 100,000 people just in Sweden is getting medically injured every year due to flaws in the system because of organizational flaws in working routines. And also 3,000 of these actually lead to fatal outcome. Totally, totally unnecessary. And what we can see and what we have heard is that we have a great innovation explosion of medical innovations in biotech, medtech, genomics, pharmaceuticals that are so good. For example, 80% of all breast cancer can be cured today. But they are stuck. They are stuck in a 100-year-old body of organization and practice, which we also heard from the previous speaker. So with this misfit, for me at least, it's no wonder that we have a great severe system error. So it's obvious that we need to quite urgently detox the system and um, at least try to damage 
or, well, at least try to minimize the damage that is coming from the healthcare tsunami that no one will be able to escape. And um, since today's theme is redefining innovations, I would like to propose um, that in healthcare we should do that by separating and differentiating between soft innovations and hard innovations. And why? I think we need to put so much more spotlight on the things that we don't talk about, the things that we don't see, and that is the human factor, the system and soft innovations. I mean, hard innovations are 100 years ahead of where soft innovation is. We need to catch up with that gap. And I also believe that there are so many commercial actors like investors and entrepreneurs taking very good care of the medical hard innovations. And it should be in everyone's interest because if we don't have an innovative healthcare system that can provide with nourishing soil to the hard innovations, those won't be able to grow. And I think it must be the government's role to actually prioritize soft innovations before hard innovations, so we can close that gap. And I'm very, very happy and excited about the giant project going on in Stockholm right now. Because did you know that actually Stockholm's largest investment done historically, five billion US dollar will be invested in the nearest years in restructuring the healthcare in Stockholm. And I was quite surprised when I heard that this makes Stockholm to one of Europe's largest borrowers. So we're in good company with Greece and Portugal, actually. <laughs> um, seriously, it's a bit scary also. It's our tax money that, well, that some politicians are gambling with. And then, of course, cross my fingers that in 10 years that we can see that it is generating return on investment or return on innovations. But we don't know. And um, it's quite interesting to see also a very strong parallel to another project that is famous, and that is the man on the moon. It was also astronomic resources invested, had never been done before very difficult, including life and death issues, and you have the global spotlight. So, if we succeed in Stockholm, we will be very proud and perhaps the role model of future healthcare, or we will be embarrassed. And what's more unique for Stockholm is also the fact that we have access to the secret sauce that has been invented by the chef called Professor Michael Porter at Harvard Business School. And it's the value-based healthcare that I truly believe is a hot candidate for the next paradigm. And uh, Cleveland Clinic is often used as a very good example of having successfully cooked this sauce and implemented it. And Obama is very often also citing it as a good role model. And uh, Stockholm actually has all the five key ingredients that is needed for this sauce. And the most valuable and the most important raw material is, is the data. We have rich, rich data in many ways. So one can then ask, what is missing? Well, JFK once declared that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. And on the 20th of July, 1969, the impossible was made possible. So, shouldn't we, almost half a century later, not be able to send a patient into our future or current healthcare and safely back home again? I believe that what our healthcare needs now is a vision for this decade, as bold and as clear as the one JFK formulated back in the 1960s. 
and we did it really now. So, thanks for me. Thank you.